Okay, so tonight I thought it would be interesting for a change to uh, go over some pawn structures. Maybe this will be something that we do every month or something. Maybe once a month we can we can try to give this a go. Um, there was a special request. Uh, Arjun, I thought Arjun would be here. He said Maroxy Bind. Somebody else said, okay, maybe we can do the French advanced pawn structure. I think people are, are generally interested in, in different pawn structures, so maybe this can become a, a regular thing. So if there's something you guys want to see, just let me know what kind of pawn structure should we cover. Um, okay, but a couple of people, I just asked people this week, and a couple of people said Maroxy Bind. Um, what's that all about? So I, I did want to talk about this position here that we got on the board, so we can go ahead and, and throw it over there. We, uh, we can see from this position, and I've chosen to go for a Maroxy Bind that comes out of the Accelerated Dragon, so there's... What really characterizes this pawn structure is that White has already advanced his C and E pawns. So he's got a pawn on C4 and E4, and you can tell at some point a C pawn got traded for White's D pawn, and White took it back with something, probably a knight, maybe a queen. But the pawns on C4 and uh, E4 is what makes this a Maroxy bind pawn structure. So it, things can be a little bit different. It doesn't have to be with black Fianchetto wing as bishop. It could also be sort of a hedgehog. It could come out of all sorts of different Sicilians. It could be a con. Um, there's all sorts of different ones. And we'll notice that there are some, some subtle differences. And an opening structure as complex as this, we won't have time to cover absolutely everything. So we're going to cover this. I'll only mention that one difference in a position like this, so we'll pretend black decided he's going to put his bishop on e7 rather than on g7. One difference is that, well, now white can try to load up on the d file and get some pressure on the d pawn, um, which is fine. Black should be able to defend properly in most cases. But we're going to focus on this. So the, the biggest thing in this position, I guess the, the most critical element in the position, is space. White has more space. And in a lot of Sicilians, black can easily equalize if you can play a move like d5. Well, in a structure like this, it's going to be very, very hard for black to ever engineer such a break. Um, especially when you've already played g6, because to do this, you would have to play you know, e6 and then d5. And that does create a lot of dark squared weaknesses around the king. So particularly in the accelerated dragon move order, um, it's very unlikely that black will ever play the move d5. And White's plans uh, really involve constriction. It's called Maroxy Bind for a reason. You want to prevent Black from doing all of his plans. So I think it does make sense to at first talk about uh, Black's plans in this position. So if Black is looking for activity, what kind of pawn breaks does he have in a position like this? Well, for one thing, he can try to open up lines on the queen side and get some play by moves like a6 and b5. This is probably the most typical way for black to try to get some counterplay in a position like this. Um, so white should do things to prevent it. A very common pawn structure that white will achieve over on the queen side is pawns on b3 and a4. Um, we'll have a knight on c3, which can prevent you know moves like this. So this might be one of the big battles that goes on in an opening like this. It's also possible, but it is a little bit risky, for black to play a move like f5. Now, most likely, because both people have moved their c-pawns, the kings are going to be castled on the king side. So almost every game is going to see king side castling for both sides in these types of positions. So you can see a move like f5 does open you know, a lot of diagonals towards the black king. So it is risky, but it, it certainly is a possible thing that might happen in a position like this. And as for white, well, in addition to constricting, one of his major plans is a kingside attack. You can imagine, um, so I guess one big thing too is what's he gonna do with this F pawn. You can imagine moves like F4, and if there's a bishop here on E6, which is pretty typical of this structure, a move like F5 might gain a tempo on the bishop, and it also gives you the possibility of opening lines by taking on G6 at, at some moment. And because you have more space in a position where you've done this, you can imagine um, rooks from any one of these files uh, might come up and over and be useful in an attack. Although there was a game too, I'm, I'm thinking um, about another plan. Sometimes you can play f3 followed by h4. And this was, there was the game from the Sinkfield Cup.
when Fabiano was 7-0. and And uh, he played this way against Carlson. Carlson, you know, played this, this way as black. And so he could have gone 8-0, and, and he got a very good position, very comfortable edge with white. Um, what ended up happening was Carlson played h5, and after some recaptures, so maybe I can actually put this on the board. I guess I can do, I guess I can do funny stuff. So this is sort of what happened in that game. Um, but then he castled kingside, which was kind of weird. But you guys can look up that game if you're interested. Uh, it was a very good, the opening was a very good example of how white can get an advantage um, in this type of position. So with that being said, and do you guys have any other questions about this pawn structure? Do you? Do you got a question? Nope. Okay. Um, so with that being said, we're going to jump to our first game. We'll see a game from White's perspective, a game from Black's perspective. Take a look here. This will be our first game, so we're going to check this out from White's perspective. It's the game uh, Loren Frezine versus Robert Kempinski. It was played in Bundesliga. And uh, let's go ahead and see what happened. So it, we arrived via a very unusual opening. It wasn't an E4 game. It came out of a, do you know this opening? No. Do you know this opening? King's Indian, yeah, okay. Good job. <laughs> um, so yeah, how can this possibly get to our structure? Well, black played C5 and he ended up taking here. Okay, we'll put a couple more moves on the board and now we'll, we'll pause for a second and uh, think about this position. Um, and we're not really too worried about any of the theory here. It's not just openings explained. But there are a couple things to keep in mind. Um, when you're playing with less space, as black is here, you, you want to trade at least some of the minor pieces. Because it's really hard to maneuver when you don't have any space. Your pieces are cramped, and if you need to go from one side to the other, it's going to be very difficult when you have pieces that are bumping into each other. So... Uh, Black, for his part, wants to exchange at least some of the minor pieces to make sure that he can always easily maneuver around. Um, so he played a very typical move in this position. He took the knight. So sometimes white, even earlier, plays a move like knight c2. You can also play knight b3. Just to avoid this trade. If white can keep all of the pieces on the board, especially early on, then he can very often just get a great position where black can't even move. But in this game, black decided to take. And in most openings, that might seem really strange. You know, you're bringing your opponent's piece to the center. Um, it seems very, very good for white. And, okay, I mean, white's always slightly better um, in these types of positions. So much so that even for a long time, uh, like the 1950s and stuff, they were like, you, this is a big mistake by black. You can't play this way. The Moroxy bind is just too good. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's good and if you can constrict all of their plans, but okay, really decent players are, are playing this position um, as both sides. So, uh, and there's basically two plans now for black. He's going to decide what he wants to do with his bishop. In the game, we're going to look at bishop to e6. Another very possible continuation we'll see in the next game is bishop d7 to c6 with pressure on e4. Personally, this would be my preference, but, you know, okay, really good people do this. And there's also another maneuver that I guess we should keep in mind for black. One thing that black often does is he plays the move knight to d7, which offers a trade of the dark squared bishops, and he's thinking about playing moves like a5, knight to c5, and, and having a very good knight. So... Um, and you might be thinking, well, when you play the dragon, for example, you never want to trade your dark squared bishop. But in this opening, it's very often black that does want to trade the dark squared bishops. The move c4 does create some dark squared weaknesses on the queen side that perhaps you can exploit. Um, and more than that, if you just look at, in this guy in particular, what is adopting a strategy of putting lots of pawns on light squares and you know, sometimes he ends up putting basically all of his pawns on light squares, and that bishop can end up being silly. So one thing that you often want to try to reach your dream endgame if you're playing this as black is a good knight versus a bad bishop. So if you can drop this guy back, and these guys get traded, and then if he puts a knight here, and you're able to take it, 
you might end up in a position where you have this knight that gets to live on c5, and he has this bad bishop here on e2. So that's one of the main themes in this opening. So if you're able to do that as black, you've probably at least equalized, maybe you're even better. Um, but white plays this move f4, which is not the most common move. Queen to d2 is more common. But I quite like this move because it stops black from doing his most obvious plan. Because now, I guess we'll test the audience. If knight to d7, what's, what's white's move here? f5, just trapping the bishop. Okay, so I like this move f4. It's a prophylactic move. It's preventing black from doing the maneuver that he wants to do. Um, so in the game, black played rook to c8. So he's attacking the c4 pawn. Obviously, he's leaving his a7 pawn unguarded. So white defended it. And now perhaps we... We might be able to get away with bishop takes a7. Looks pretty risky. But uh, black decides to play queen a5. So the queen is starting to come into those dark squares. And he protected his a-pawn. So rook to c1. Now a6. And if you know what black's next move is, which hopefully it's obvious, um, what is black trying to do? Why did he play a6? B5, exactly. So this is what black is trying to do. Uh, he wants to play a move like B5. But white decided to prevent it, and that's exactly how white should play. He wants to be thinking about stopping all of black's counterplay, and then he'll use a space in the activity of his pieces later on in the, the later part of the middle game. So how did white stop black from playing the move B5? Uh, it was played in uh, 2010. And in this position, White played the move A4. Yeah, I was thinking about that. You are thinking about it, but you didn't want to say it? Well, then we got into this whole discussion of getting here, so... Yeah. A4. A4. Okay. Um, so we still can't play Knight to D7. We would like to. So he played a, an interesting move here. King H8. So Black is thinking, well, I... I can't go back because then you play f5 and trap my bishop. Um, I can't really go here because you take my knight and yeah. Um, so he's like, all right, I got it. I'm going to play knight to g8, which probably isn't the best plan. So black did play a little bit goofy in this game. But what's really important to kind of watch and take note of in this game is just how easily white's pawns went like this. So white just pushed all of his pawns and really overran black. So... And it's also funny, too. So he, he went to h8. Fine, I go to h1. Uh, you, you can tell these are two professionals. They put their kings all the way in the corner. Yeah. But uh, what's really funny, too, is do you know what the best move is, according to Stockfish? It's, it's really funny. Yeah, what should black do? So Stockfish didn't like either of those king moves. But <laughs> king g8. King g8, yeah. Uh, <laughs> best move for black, king g8. And then white doesn't have to repeat. He can do anything useful. I think he want, the computer wants to do rook b1 or something. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, right. What does Stockfish know? So that means, I mean, this, this was kind of a mistake by black. But he went back. Okay, so are we really going to be able to, to take advantage of this? Hello, welcome, welcome. Um, and so... I guess White is thinking too. I mean, he has to come up with some plan. What is he going to do? Is he going to play on the king side? Is he going to play on the queen side? Um, he decides, well, one thing that I want to do is maybe I want to put my knight on d5. And then maybe I, I can think about pushing my queen side a little bit. But as we spoke about a little bit earlier, there's a lot of new faces now, which is good. Um, Black is usually quite happy to make this trade. Because then if he can trade the bishop for the knight, and these two people get traded, and black is stuck with this knight versus bishop, usually that's the end game black wants to achieve, but really this knight should be like way over here. Um, but he doesn't, so he doesn't want to go to d5 because that would let black trade. 
And again, we have more space. We don't want to trade the pieces. So what did white play in this position? What was that? You want to take the bishop? Okay, so this seems like a very possible move. Um, did you have a follow-up after this? Okay. Um, and then probably he'll have to play a move like this. Um, and so I think this is very good for white as well. So this shouldn't be too bad. I think white is just waiting here because, well, I certainly don't mind if you take me and then you bring me up here with check. So I guess he's thinking, well, that, that's not going away and maybe I'll take your bishop on the next move. I can take it whenever I want. So he did wait on that, although that looks also very good for white, um, your idea. But he wanted to play knight d5, but he needs to get that bishop out of the way. Bishop yeah. G4, trying to trade bishops. Okay, bishop g4. You want to trade? Why do you want to uh, trade the... Well, you can take here check first. Um, but, yeah, you didn't probably didn't want to do all these trades. Um, so this actually alleviated Black's position quite a lot. I just got to get my knight back into the game. Um, maybe you're still better there. But, <laughs> but again, when you have more space like this, you really don't want to trade the pieces too much. Oh, yeah, what about f5 here? Okay, excellent move. That's exactly what was played. So, Black got it out of the way. And now knight to d5 with a very strong threat. Let me, how do I waste a move? Let me just waste a move here. What's the threat? Bishop b6. Yeah, bishop b6 and the queen is trapped. So, pretty strong threat. <laughs> uh, and Let's see, so facing that threat, he decided, well, he could play queen d8, but uh, in the game he took on d4 which probably isn't the best. So this is kind of like what you wanted to do, except for now we get to do it with tempo because black voluntarily brought our queen to the, the center. So that's pretty good for us. All right. So we played f6. And you can tell that this sort of was a big success for white. The opening really went white's way. He has a great position, and we're going to try to see how do we win a position like this. Because, okay, it's one thing to get such an awesome position, and then it's another thing to, to convert a position like this. Um, and I would warn you that Black does have one plan. And, I mean, in all openings, you want to think about what your opponent's doing. But especially in an opening where your whole goal is to prevent your opponent from doing what they want to do, you really want to think every move about what your opponent is doing. So if you were Black and you wanted to improve your position, um, can you find a really bad piece... I mean, all your pieces are really bad. But can you find one piece that you might be able to find a really good square for? Um, and then we'll see if we... The knight? Yeah. You just can't find a good square? And, I mean, so first, just look anywhere on the board. You know, look at all 64 squares. If you could teleport, if you could just magically go to a square, where would you want to go? Where's the best, safest square for that knight? E5. Yeah, E5. So if you were black, you'd probably want to get your knight to e5. And so the next step is just, how do I get it there? And so if you think about it, um, maybe I can maneuver my knight to the e5 square. So this is one thing that, that black wants to do. Um, so at some point, white might want to consider a move like queen to e3. Or you can play what he played, which is also really good. And if I remember right, I think it was this position. The computer wanted to do something that is not very human. Um, the computer wanted to take here and then, okay, bring this rook up and over somewhere. And why I say it's not really human is, well, this pawn is really, really good. <laughs> it's constricting all of Black's pieces. Uh, if you do end up taking, I mean, okay, so this, this actually is a very good move in this particular position. Um, you are letting these pawns become a little bit more mobile. So that's one good thing for, from the Black perspective. But if something like this works, um, in this particular position, it's just black does seem really cramped. Uh, his pieces are, are really log jammed in the, the back here. So something like this might work, but from a human perspective, it seems, well, my f pawn five, I'm, my pawn on f5, I'm never gonna move that. That's just such a strength, <laughs> uh, such a thorn in, in black's position because this guy can't move and this guy can barely move. Um, 
But what he played here was also really nice. And it was sort of a, a tactical move. And probably he's thinking, well, at some point, Black actually does have a plan. It's not like I should just keep wasting time, you know, just play like nothing moves for a while and he's going to suffer. Um, Black actually does have a plan. He's going to try to bring his knight to e5. So he decides to get serious on the queen side. And he does a very good job. So here he plays the move b4. Um, so it's sort of a tactic. Uh, if you take here, the point is knight to b6. Though he should maybe consider playing this way too, based on how he gets no counterplay in the actual game. So giving up some material might might be okay here. I mean, it's not okay, but uh, something like this. <laughs> uh, okay, obviously white's better because he's up material. Um, but maybe you can you can wriggle free. In the game, he decided not to lose material. Okay, it's also a good choice. And he brought his queen back to d8. Um, now, our a pawn is attacked by the bishop. So he found a good tempo move. Knight to b6. So he's just sort of blockading the black pawns. Um, I protected my a4 pawn. I'm attacking your rook. I'm threatening to win in exchange. So the rook moved. And now... Um, what would you guys play here as white? So again, these are the kinds of little decisions that you have to to make in the game of chess. That often it's these little moves that are sort of the the hardest. Um, though I don't think he played. I don't even think he played the best move here. I can't remember if he played it here. I think he just waited here. I think he did nothing. What would you do? A5, slip knight, stop thinking, Okay, yeah, A5, this is a perfectly fine move. Um, I assume I would just go here. And very, it's very good for you. I mean, there's there's no reason not to do this. Um, here, did he wait, or did he play queen E3? Because if I remember right, you know, you should play a move like queen E3, preventing black from doing his own plan. Um, but in the game, he just, he waited. <laughs> Okay, now he's attacking the A-pawn. So, okay, so now A5. This is very similar. Um, now he went here. Okay, so now a move like Queen E3, preventing Black's plan. But Black wanted to renew his plan. So he had to defend the H6 square. Uh, showed it to somebody today, and they wanted to go here. That's, that's not the way to do it. Um, <laughs> King to G7. So now I can do my knight maneuver. Um, what do you do here? All right, and he put his rook back. So white uh, has wasted a lot of time. Sometimes you get positions that are so good that black absolutely can't move. I mean, here black, you know, has a plan. I mean, okay, you're gonna get it here, and then if your knight gets there, I mean, still white's probably better if you teleport there. But uh, at least he has a plan. Sometimes you have a position that's so good that, you know, you, you just can't move and white can do nothing forever and ever and ever. And you should. You should do nothing forever and ever. And then 50 moves later, move a pawn and then do nothing forever. And then wait 50 moves and capture something and then just keep waiting. So that does happen a lot where it's just white and then it's, it's so hard to play. It's black. And black usually sometimes overpresses or just tries to break free and you can't handle it anymore. Um, these are, are pretty decent players, so that didn't happen. But Rook C1 does have... A point. I mean, he is lining up on the same file as an unprotected rook, which will have significance um, because it's letting white possibly play a move like b5. That's that's the point of his move, and it's not really easy to move your, your rook out of the way. So he's like, all right, I'll just go through with my maneuver. And I do like how white played on the, the queen side now. b5. So the bishop dropped back. And his, his plan here was, was pretty good. Now, very often, it's black that actually gets lots of counterplay on the queen side. And when the queen side opens up, it's really good for black. Um, but here, just based on the fact that his pieces are so jammed up, it's actually white can make a use out of this, this activity by opening up the queen side, which will be sort of a temporary thing if black gets all of his pieces over there and we trade off all the rooks then all right, you didn't do anything with your advantage. But here white actually can open up the queen side quite a bit. 
and uh, and make use of the fact that his pieces are a lot better coordinated. And I like the way that he did it. He took on a6. Alright, so I take back. And I played the move c5. And here, black blundered. He played a move that looks pretty good, but unfortunately, this is the losing move. So, Black must have been thinking, you're attacking my a6 pawn, so I'll defend it. So he played bishop to b5, which unfortunately is the losing move, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Perhaps he should just um, consider trading. Trading is usually good when you're defending. And not a move like bishop to b5, because it'll be similar to the game. Um, but perhaps he could try to go for some counterplay. And something like this still is really good for white. Um, but perhaps that was his best bet. But he played here. Now, so here you might want to pause your videos. You might want to think about it. It's, it's a little bit harder. Um, hopefully some people can figure it out. So I'm going to give you guys like a couple minutes here just to think about how you would play as white. And it is sort of a, a tactical variation. Um, yeah, you got it? You figured it out? What do you think it is? Um, C takes D6. Okay, so if you do this immediately, um, I suppose I have to go here. And you'll take back, presumably, probably with this. Um, and then here, which... Okay, this is probably good for you. Um, I think you can even... You have the right idea, but I think you can even do this uh, a little bit better. 95. 95. Okay. Um, <laughs> so here it is, and yeah. Knight D5. Okay, I will go here. That's what happened in the game. Oh, then yeah, now you want to take on d6. Okay, excellent. Um, so here black decided to take bishops. A little in-between move here. Um, and now he took back. And I think it's very, very tempting here for the human maybe just to take on a6. And probably white's winning after this, but... Uh, he actually played a much stronger move. You know, it's really tempting, you know, just take free stuff, which is good enough. Um, but he played a, a very, very powerful move here. So does anybody know what white played? Knight to c7. Knight to c7. Awesome. And here, black just gave it up. He resigned. Um, all I have to do is draw one arrow, and you'll realize that this is really good for white. Um, so it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to end up losing material here. Your queen's attacked, so either you're just going to give up material now, or you're going to move your um, queen out of the way, then I'm going to fork you and take this. Um, perhaps people in this room shouldn't resign in this position, <laughs> but uh, okay, at the Grandmaster level, he realized there is an exchange, and I'm playing Fresen A, so I, I give it up. You want to come in? Yeah, you, you won't even be the highest rated player in the room. You don't even know it. So, um, okay, so that was this game. And so it's a great example for the white side of, he just, his pawns just went, and black had less space. He moved his pieces backwards. Um, and he got himself into a, a very big bind. And white did an excellent demonstration of how to break through on the queen side and, you know, create a lot of problems for his opponent. I do want to try to get to this next game because it's, I didn't know if we'd make this into a uh, one or two part series, but I, I wanna try to get this done. And so I haven't read these annotations yet. So this is the third round of the tournament. This is Luca Lenick versus Laquan Liam. Um, Laquan has played here before. Um, he's played for the, uh, the archbishops and he's played in a couple tournaments here. So very nice guy. Uh, and he had the black pieces here and this will be a demonstration of the kinds of things that black should do in this position. So again, it was another very unusual way of reaching the Meroxy bind. But uh, okay, here it is. And oh, he analyzes knight to g4, which is an interesting line. But okay, let's, let's just get to it. And in the last game, we saw knight takes d4 in this position. Um, he decided to play bishop to d7 first. So if white wants, he can play a move like knight to c2. That's a very popular move. Uh, queen to d2 is a very popular move. In this game, he played rook to c1, which is not as common. But uh, okay, so now we, there were some trades. And 
we'll see black does something different instead of putting his bishop on e6 he has this other idea of getting pressure on the e pawn so white is forced to defend it and this does make it easier remember in the last game it was hard for black to do his his favorite maneuver in this type of position um but here he's able to do it okay bishop to e3 and this is always a big decision for white should you trade or should you not trade? And usually it's about 50-50 what people end up doing in these types of positions. But not trading is a very respectable idea because, again, if we can trade off these guys as black and you put your knight here and I take it, then I get a good knight versus a bad bishop situation, which can happen and will happen sort of in this game. But in this game, bishop e3 um, in black, We'll eventually come up with a sort of a clever, crafty way of trading those bishops, so can't wait. Here, a5, just solidifying the c5 square for the knight, so the b4 can't come and kick your knight away. Um, b3, okay, very solid. And now, a very typical maneuver that's very interesting in this position was played by black. Well, no, I think first he went here. Okay. Now a very interesting maneuver. Now, in general, since black is hoping to go on the queen side and break things open, at some point maybe I want to inter, uh, engineer the move b5 into the position. Um, well, these rooks would probably be better somewhere over here on the queen side. But the queen's in the way. And actually, the queen might end up being really useful over on the king side, where possibly in some lines, you know, you can play a move like this and try to trade off... Ooh, trade off the bishops. Um, in such a position, maybe I'd also have to play moves like this. If I could get all these moves in and trade the bishops, that's a very typical thing for black. But as it is, you know, our queen's in the way of our rook. So he decided to play queen to b6. And his plan is, I'm going to bring my rook over, and I'm going to drop my queen back, and then we can try for that plan. Um, and I can try to trade the dark squared bishops again. And that's exactly what happened. Knight to b5. Wow, he analyzes like all sorts of lines here. Um, knight, knight to d5. Gives white nothing. We'll just look at this briefly. And he analyzes this long line. Alright, equal. Okay, and he analyzes a whole bunch of lines here, but... Alright, we're gonna not go through it. But I mean, knight to d5 looks like a very normal, sensible move. But, uh, he decides to play a move like knight to b5. Okay, which does, of course, prevent my queen from coming here. Um, and you'll notice in this line that he gave after we take and go here, you really don't want to double the pawns here. That You know, you might be like, yay, double pawns, but it's it's actually black that's now going to get a lot of queenside pressure. So something like this is, is not what you're aiming to do. Um, so by putting his knight there, he does prevent queen to be four, but obviously that's not the dream square for the knight. Uh, now... As per the plan, now we're going to drop our queen back to d8. And we saw that in the last game, so they did it again. King h1. What's that? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, black should play king h8. Um, except for really he wants to get his, his king to h7. So he's going to end up doing this because he's going to do this and this. That's his plan, um, which is a typical plan. But we'll see also in this game it was... Uh, he played something slightly more unusual and more beautiful, so we'll take a look at that. All right, so Black has achieved his basic plan. Um, he went back, and now you'll notice, too, it's kind of difficult for White to ever get his knight to d5. d5 is where the knight really wants to be at some point, and then if Black ever takes, um, you know, you'll be able to decide how you want to transform the pawn structure. But... Uh, as it is, it's, it's sort of difficult. So white kind of went through a lengthy maneuver to try to get his knight back to d5. So we'll see what, what happens here. So he, didn't, he wasn't interested in trading that guy. Um, so this is the start of a very funny plan for white. His plan, well, we'll, we'll let it unfold because it's kind of interesting. Um, h5, as per the plan, he goes here. So his idea is... I'm going to bring my knight to d5 that way. Um, I might also 
go this way. But I'm gonna try to get that knight back to d5. So he got the rook out of the way, the bishop out of the way, and now he's gonna do a knight maneuver. Okay, king h7. Back goes the knight. And, um, okay, so it was, at this point in the tournament too, both players, well, they were the only two players with uh, two points, so it's the third round. And so I guess they both wanted to win, so Laquan said, okay, your knight went away, I go back. You might expect, well, uh, you know, this uh, Lenik is about 100 points lower rated. Maybe he's just going to repeat, you know, and who knows, maybe Laquan would have done something different. But they were both there to win. You know, they both wanted to win and be the, the sole leader of the tournament. So he says, all right, I'm going to go through with my plan. And perhaps going to c3 was even better. He probably should have considered going to c3. This does give black one extra option. Um, now, I, now that you interfered with this diagonal, I can just safely put my rook here on h6. And then he analyzes like a thousand other lines, a thousand moves deep. Um, <laughs> okay, but he says both sides seem to have accomplished what they wanted. Um, queen f2. And now I really like this move by black. So again, you may want to pause your videos here. Um, we'll see if the audience can come up with what black played. There's probably more than one good move. But he played the prettiest move, which is important. And it does have to do with the fact that we are trying to trade the dark squared bishops. So he found a... A very interesting way of going about it. The move that Black ended up playing in the game, Queen H8. You don't see that very often. Um, so he goes on this very long diagonal. And his immediate idea is Queen F6. And, um, you know, there's going to be some trades going on here. Uh, so very, very interesting idea. Rook C2. All right, he's, he's defending the second rank. Very good. Queen f6. And what happens is now, since that knight has to move somewhere, um, he analyzes this. He says here, threatening knight d5. And he, he, gets like, he does way too much analysis. That's awesome. Okay, we'll, we'll go through that later. We don't have the time. So after knight d5... Um, we're going to see a transformation into the kind of endgame that Black is really, really looking for in this position. So now we get to trade lots of stuff. We get to take the knights off the board. And there's a lot of ways that White should consider taking back. He decided to take with the piece. Um, perhaps better was here, but it relies on you seeing a really awesome tactic. And in this position, um, something like this. This is his analysis and he equal. Um, everything you do, it's equal. But he took with the rook, and I think, is it this position? In some position, there's a super tactic. It could be this one. Yeah, so in this position, there's a super tactic. Uh, can anybody see what Black could have played in the game he traded the bishops, which, and then he gets the kind of end game that he's looking for. So in the game, he traded the bishops. And he's got the knight versus the light squared bishop, and white has all his pawns on the light squares. So black should be slightly better. It's the kind of thing that you're hoping to achieve, and so black played the opening very well. It was a big success for him. Um, but there, there's more monster tactics to come, so we don't want to get bogged down here. You can pause at home. So he could have played this very excellent move. Knight takes e4, which seems crazy because I just take it. But now I can take this bishop. So if you take with your queen, I'm going to take on f1. So this actually ends up being pretty good for black. He says, looks very drawish to me. So um, yeah, you want a little bit of material, so black has to be a little bit better. But opposite colored bishops, rooks, he's like, all right, it's a draw. Um, that's all of his analysis so far. Not a dad draw. Um, right, that's, that's chess. But instead, he went here, so I don't know if he saw that move. Maybe he saw that move, and he's like, eh, that's probably a draw. Um, oh, and he says exactly what I said. He said, as a rule, if black manages to exchange the dark squared bishops and give up the light squared one for white's knight in this structure, he is fine. But here is an example. Um, black's knight seems to be a bit more active than white's bishop. Okay, right. So this is exactly the kind of endgame 
that Black is hoping to achieve. Um, all right, so he goes down. He's going to try to tie White down. It's nice that now we get to use our queen on that super long diagonal. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of things we could do here. He goes back. He's he does want to prevent a move like e5. So the knight retreat makes sense. I don't want you to play e5. And uh, okay, and he was, says he, he was hoping to provoke White's next move, which was to attack something. Queen to g5. Um, he gives a question mark exclaim. And now, okay, we just need to defend against that. And so it seems like perhaps Black has misplayed this position. But maybe he's even, it's even more cunning than White appreciates. So it appears like, well, you just blundered upon. And White will be better. So. Nom, 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 nom. And, uh, and here again, I guess we'll, we'll ask the class what you would do here. Because if I remember right, if I remember right, he played a really good move here. Um, or maybe he checked first. Probably checked first. Okay, he checked first. And you, you pretty much have to play here. Um, let's, let's look at his King H1 question mark. Of course not King H1. Um... <laughs> Probably because queen d1. Uh, <laughs> and then if you're take, really complicated. When black's rooks are much stronger than white's queen. So so that was possible. Um, so of course not that. So rook f2, but this also, I mean, has a problem. Now you're in this pin. And uh, all right, black's going to come up with a really... Really powerful way to exploit that in the future. And, you know, a really good move by Black. Really good move. Sort of confusing and probably he did not consider this move. I don't think White was thinking about this move. Yeah? Rook to c5. Rook to c5, yeah. Right, an excellent move. Um, and what is White to do? Well, there's, there's only one move here. So this this seems like very tempting, right? It looks it looks good, but it's actually a big blunder, big blunder, because um, I don't have to take back right away. I can take here, and you're in trouble because you know I'm taking on f2 with check, and uh, so this would be a big blunder. But it's it's really tempting. So I mean, White is in sort of a predicament. So his only move is actually to give up the queen. But, you know, you're getting rooks, and so when I take back, you get the rook, um, and, I um, mean, okay, the computer, when I looked at this, it's like zero, 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 but it's, it seems pretty obvious that it has to be black that's better, because white's all tied down, and black has the plan that he went through with the game, and, and he, and, wow, if this font was a little bit bigger, you wouldn't be able to read any of that, because it would be, like, off the page, he wrote, wrote a lot of text here. Um, but he played a really, really good move. And so here you actually, you may want to pause at, at home. There's no way we have time to think about it. But there's a super awesome tactical maneuver, strategy and tactics all together. So if you want to come up with what plan you would come up with here as black, if you're able to come up with the plan that uh, Laquan came up with, then, then a big congrats because what he did here was spectacular. Um, and even though the computer said zero, 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 it's still like, wow. Once you see that plan, you're like, what? Black wins. Um, so we're going we're gonna to give it away. H4. And we'll see. Oh, and then he gives away the reason. So that's good. So now you guys know the reason, so you better be able to like tell me why he did that. Um, but, but we won't spoil it for them. So mem memorize that. Got it. You got it? Yep. You write it down? Yep. And then you guys can you know, look really, really smart. So this is the beginning of a, a very powerful continuation. You know, if you, you want to know a little bit earlier, you got to be in the live audience. It's the only way. So uh, B4, this not a very good move, but it yeah, seems like it makes sense because he's trying to get his rook active, so he got that pawn out of the way. Hey, what does he analyze? It's like, no, they're bad. I can't show you that because that's the answer to the real thing. Okay. <laughs> um, so he played rook a5. 
Now, if your knight moves away, and his knight did move away, then you can play rook to d5. So the computer was screaming, just play e6, and then knight h5. But uh, he went for it right away. And while it does allow white a little bit more activity, uh, it doesn't last for long, because you're all tied up. So here. But you're still pinned, and this is very, very annoying. And uh, he doesn't last too much longer. So if you guys were... Let's give away the move. Um, hmm, what would you guys play here? Uh, so the amazing plan, again, you can pause if you want to figure it out. Knight to g3. We won't <laughs> explain more than that, but okay. So the obvious point is if you take this, uh, I take here, and you lose. Right? You know, okay, so you can go back and... I can do whatever I want. I don't even have to do anything. Um, okay, well, this is going to be good. I'm going to take that rook eventually. Maybe I won't take it now. I'll take it whenever I want. But you're, you're still all tied down and can't move. So you can't really take that knight. Um, in the game, c5 was played. Temporarily blocking the pin. No big deal. I'll just kick your rook away. And probably you should just go back to d2 and defend passively. But he decided activity, you know, I'm going to take on f7 check and etc. But he just took here and uh, white took here. But now black is completely winning. So his king moved. And white was in a particularly greedy mood. He decided to go here. Let's see his line. So his line is h3 and then take this. Check. Okay. Let's see where this is going. Lots of checks. Take all your stuff. And push my pawn, and I win. Okay, that's a good line. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got a lot of Akobian fans. You push the pawn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but okay, he took here. Very greedy. And now uh, Black really capitalized in this position. Played one more amazing move. And the game came to its conclusion. So... Who can find the move that Black played in this position? So if you're just walking in, it's it's Black to move, and let's keep that door shut. It's scary out there. Have you got it? Yeah. Knight to h1. Yeah, what a pretty final move. Um, and now you're just gonna lose lots and lots of material. Um, we can even see what he says. The final move is nice. Exclam. Uh, yeah. White suffers heavy material loss, and therefore he resigned. With this important win, I took the lead and managed to keep it till the end of the tournament. So yeah, a very fantastic move. And it was a very excellent um, example of the dream endgame that Black is trying to get. He got the good knight versus the bad bishop. And we saw that white was all tied up. Um, Black got to do all of the maneuvers that he wanted to do. He played correctly on the queen side. So hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of understanding of the, uh, the Meroxy bind. So if there is another pawn structure you guys want to check out, just go ahead and let me know. And uh, hit like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next week.